Uh, welcome to the second meeting on the crisis of missing or murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, my name is Lisa Mantel and I'm the Deputy Director of Technical Assistance at the Police Executive Research Forum and I'll be helping to facilitate today's session. So before we get started, uh, I just wanted to go over some logistics with Zoom. I know many of us have been using Zoom for many months now, um, nearly a year, if not longer. Um, but I just wanted to review this for those of you who aren't as familiar. Um, it, you're welcome to keep your cameras on uh, or off, whatever you'd prefer, but we would like it if you could please keep your audio muted. Uh, if you unmute yourself to ask a question, please remember to remute after speaking. Um, also, if you're joining through your phone, please remember not to put us on hold um, and use mute instead. If you put us on hold, we might hear hold music if your organization has that. Um, to avoid an echo, please use headphones uh, or a headset if you're able to. And if you're on the phone, it helps if you can keep your computer speakers all, all the way down. Uh, to see your control panel, what you need to do is hover your mouse um, either at the top or the bottom of the screen. It might be a little bit different than uh, what I'm seeing um, on my end. Uh, we do have a chat window, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat window. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the call. Um, and with the exception of the presentations uh, on the Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal and Justice Connect, uh, today's meeting will be recorded and we do plan to share the video and audio on the Operation Lady Justice website in the near future. Uh, we also plan to distribute today's presentation slides via email following the meeting. Um, if your computer audio isn't working, um, please feel free to call in over the phone. I put the call in information in the chat window. Um, you should have also received that in the Zoom invitation. Um, and if you're having any difficulty viewing uh, the slides or they freeze, um, please feel free to leave the meeting and then rejoin. Um, so I'd like to now turn it over to Matt Lysakowski from the Department of Justice Community Oriented Policing Services um, for introductions. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, welcome everyone to our second forum uh, this year, this fiscal year on the uh, MMIP issue. Uh, I see some familiar names in the participant list. So thanks to all of you who have uh, returned and for those uh, first time uh, participants as well, welcome uh, to today's session. Uh, I think we have a small enough crowd that we can actually go through. It uh, looks like we have 33 total participants. Um, so Lisa, if you wouldn't mind perhaps running through uh, the list of everyone who is uh, currently on the call and just ask them to briefly uh, introduce themselves, just your name uh, and uh, what tribe or agency you're with would be great. So we, so we know who we're talking with. Yep, will do. Um, so the first name I have is Al Kenyon. Al Kenyon. Okay, um, second person is Alex Bruce. Alex Bruce, would you like to introduce yourself? And if, if your audio is not or, uh, audio is not functioning properly, you can introduce yourself in the chat as well. That's that's perfectly fine. Uh, next person, Benjamin Estes. Uh, Bruce Lee. Hello, everyone. Uh, Bruce Lee here, Public Safety Director for the Porch Band of Creek Indians in Atmore, Alabama. I'm also the Chair for the Tribal Justice Committee for the USET Organization. Thanks, Bruce. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Weaver. Hello, I'm Chuck Weaver, a detective with the Santa Ana Pueblo Police Department in New Mexico. First time. Welcome. Thank Thanks, Detective. Uh, Dennis Wilkins. Bonjour. 
Dennis Wilkins. I'm the Director of Public Safety for the Matchabee Nashuish Band of Potawatomi Indians, Gun Lake Tribe in Shelbyville, Michigan. Welcome, Director. Thanks. Uh, Ingrid Cumberlidge. Um, hello, um, my name is Ingrid Cumberlidge. I'm the MMIP coordinator here for the District of Alaska. Thank you. Eddie Smart. Good afternoon. My name is Eddie Smart. I'm the uh, Supervisor Special Agent for the Bureau of Indian Affairs out of UN Tour Agency, Fort Shane, Utah. Good afternoon. Welcome, okay. Eddie. Uh, Elton Bigay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Elton McGay, I'm the Chief of, of Police with the Donald Autumn Nation Police Department on the Donald Autumn Tribe in Southern Arizona, uh, near the, actually against the uh, Mexican border. Good morning, everybody. Welcome or afternoon. Uh, Ernie, weigh in. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, yes, I'm uh, Ernie Wyand. I'm the MMIP coordinator for the District of Montana. Thank you. Um, Hila Jacobson. Hi, everyone. I'm Hila. I'm a, I'm a research assistant at the Police Executive Research Forum, and I uh, work with Lisa. Thanks, Hila. Uh, James Owens. We might be having some audio issues. Uh, Joel Postma. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joel Postma, the MMIP coordinator, both the uh, Western District of Michigan as well as the Eastern District, all 12 tribes in Michigan. Thank you, Jonathan Stia. Okay, Joseph Gutierrez. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Gutierrez. I am the uh, Thank you, Kathleen Lucero. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Lucero with the Sleda Police Department here in New Mexico. Thank you. And I'm Thank you. Uh, Leslie Hagan. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Hagan. I'm the Native American uh, I'm sorry, the National Indian Country Training Coordinator for the U.S. Department of Justice. Thank you. Uh, Kira Eckenweiler. Good afternoon or good morning. Sorry, my name is Kira Eckenweiler. I am from, I am working with Nordenstown Health Corporation as a Suicide Prevention Outreach Coordinator. I also am the Mayor of Unal Cleet. Thank you. Uh, Marsha Good. Hi everybody, this is Marcia Good. I'm the Executive Director of the Presidential Task Force on Missing and Murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives, also known as Operation Lady Justice. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Holstein-Wallace. Yes, hi, I'm Pamela Holstein-Wallace and I'm with the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System in the Stakeholder Engagement Branch. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina Boone. Hi there, I'm Sabrina Boone. Um, I am with Central Council Clink and Heide Indian Tribes of Alaska. I'm the Emergency Operations Coordinator here in Juneau, Alaska, and we serve all of Southeast. Thank you. Uh, Samson Cowboy. Okay, Shalimar O'Brien. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shalimar O'Brien, and I'm a Management and Program Analyst with the FBI CGIS Division in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Kane. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Stephen Kane. I'm Administrative Lieutenant with the White Mountain Apache Police Department here in White River, Arizona. Thank you. Tom Ross. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Tom Ross. I am the MMIP coordinator for the District of Nevada. Thanks. Wade Whitmer. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Wade Whitmer. I'm the uh, uh, division deputy director for the IPAWS program at FEMA. Thanks. And William C. Hello, I'm William C. with the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Thank you. Um, I apologize if we uh, if I skipped over anyone. Um, and we have a couple people on the phone. Uh, those on the phone, would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Um, good morning. This is Nancy Saylor, Chief Tribal Prosecutor for the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon. Thank you. Welcome. And I see a couple others, uh, at least one other phone number. Is there anyone else I missed who would like to introduce themselves? Uh, William Denke, I think I might have skipped over you. Yes, I was just going to jump in. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Bill Denke, and I'm on the Zoom call. Uh, uh, Chief of Police of the Saquon Band of the Kumeyaay Nation in San Diego County, California, and also Chair IACP's Indian Country Section. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there yeah, anyone this else? is Al Canyon. Hi, welcome. Yeah, I'm the customer support branch chief for IPAWS and I would really like to uh, help anyone get signed up for IPAWS if they would like to uh, and we'll get the paperwork straightened out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, one last check. Is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves who hasn't uh, done so yet? Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, I'll turn it back over to you now. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, appreciate uh, everyone uh, introducing themselves there and uh, everyone's patience with us as we go through that. Uh, it's always uh, great to uh, hear from everyone. Uh, it's a nice little audio sound check as well for folks. Um, and uh, great to see such a diverse array of tribes representing uh, on the call today. Uh, so for today's agenda, we're going to do um, uh, a couple of different uh, covered a couple of different topics here today. Um, one is going to be the law enforcement training resources that Leslie Hagen from the National Indian Country Training Initiative uh, will talk to us about. And then we'll hear uh, about the law enforcement enterprise portal and Justice Connect uh, from uh, Shalimar and William from the FBI. And then finally, uh, we'll hear from Pamela and Wade on the integrated public alert and warning system. And we'll have a Q&A session. I think it'll probably work best for us to actually uh, contain the Q&As within each block. So as you uh, have questions come, that are coming to your mind, feel free to type them in the chat. And at, each of the, at, each, at the end of each presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. And then at the very end, we'll have sort of a final discussion in Q&A period uh, if there are additional questions. So um, I think that's uh, all we wanna cover on the agenda. Is there anything else? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so the, the purpose of our sessions, again, for those who might not be joining us, uh, the COPS office has been partnering with Operation Lady Justice over the last, uh, what, year and a half now that the task force has been uh, ongoing. And uh, we're, we're really trying to engage tribal law enforcement on uh, the federal efforts around missing or murdered American Indians and Alaska Native issues. Uh, we're hosting uh, these sessions this year, uh, four of them. We had one in January that provided a brief overview of Operation Lady Justice and the Attorney General's MMIP initiative uh, and provided some brief updates uh, sort of generally on those initiatives. And these next three sessions, including today's, we're going to get a little more into the uh, sort of meat and bones of on things around specific issues uh, and topics that uh, you all had raised um, in last year's sessions that we wanted to uh, get more in the weeds on so that you all can learn more uh, and have some dialogue on those topics. So uh, today, again, we're going to cover sort of the training uh, issue, collaboration, uh, and the alerting uh, systems. 
We're looking at two more engagements this fiscal year uh, in the summer and maybe early fall. We, we have we have the uh, the dates uh, tentatively set, but uh, things can change. So uh, topics and dates could could uh, could change a bit. But what we're looking at is volunteer engagement and technical assistance for the next session. Um, the COPS office has been working with IACP on a volunteer engagement program to uh, assist tribal law enforcement on emergent missing uh, persons cases. So we're uh, in the process of developing that program and piloting it with a couple of tribes. And so our, we're looking at the next session to focus on, on that topic uh, and tell you more about that program as we, uh, as we finalize it a bit more. And then our last session, we're looking at focusing on funding and resources, as well as uh, likely some uh, feedback and uh, updating on the tribal community response plans that uh, the MMIP coordinators uh, are working on with various tribes in their locations. Uh, so that's our plan for the rest of the discussions. Uh, again, today we're going to focus on three different aspects, the training, the collaboration, and the alerts. And I think that is all I have and want to make sure we have enough time for everyone today. So I think we can turn it over to Leslie for the training presentation. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. So Leslie, you can share yours. I keep getting a message that said host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, I just made you a co-host, so you should be oh, able to perfect. share now. Okay. Oops. So my name is Leslie Hagen, as I said in the introduction. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about training, um, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, on the screen, you see a picture of the National Advocacy Center uh, that is in Columbia, South Carolina, and it sits on the campus of the University of South Carolina. Uh, the Department of Justice has had uh, its National Training Center uh, for assistant US attorneys and agents and now Indian country. Um, it's been down there for more than 20 years. The National Indian Country Training Initiative started in July of 2010. I was fortunate enough to uh, get the job uh, to be the coordinator and to start the initiative. Uh, prior to moving to Columbia, I spent five years in Washington, D.C. as the Native American Issues Coordinator in the Executive Office for U.S. Attorneys. Uh, previous to that, I was an Assistant United States Attorney in the Western District of Michigan, where I prosecuted violent crime in Indian Country, primarily domestic violence, sexual assault, and, and child abuse on 11 of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian reservations. I've also been a uh, assistant prosecuting attorney in the state system in Michigan and an elected prosecutor. So I have more than 30 years of experience as a prosecutor and I have been working with tribes since 1992. So there is my contact information and I know you're gonna get, uh, get it after the presentation, um, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them for you. Uh, this is a picture of me, since I don't have my camera on. This is uh, pre-COVID hair, uh, me teaching at the NAC. I'm actually also running a test. Um, so I have half my brain doing this presentation, and the other half of my brain is running a test for the criminal jurisdiction in Indian country class, which we will talk about in a few minutes. So what is possible through the National Indian Country Training Initiative? We do residential training at the NAC. Uh, previous to the pandemic, we would have between 12 and 15 residential courses a year uh, in Columbia. And most of those classes uh, dealt with some type of public safety issue affecting tribal communities. Uh, many of them domestic violence, sexual abuse, child abuse, um, and uh, human trafficking. We also do cultural property law, we've done cigarette trafficking, really a, a myriad of topics that um, impact Indian country. Um, since the pandemic, everything has transitioned to virtual. 
Uh, but once the pandemic is behind us and we are open again, um, I expect that we will continue to hold residential training. One of the things that I think is great about the initiative is we pay all of the travel and lodging. So essentially it is free training for um, anybody uh, who is selected to attend the class. Um, so you are getting national level expert training uh, at no cost to the student or to the tribe. <coughs> Excuse me, we pay airfare, meals, uh, hotel. You saw the big building there. We have about 250 hotel rooms right in the building. We also do training in the field. Um, I host classes in the field. Uh, many of those are done in partnership with the BIA or the FBI or uh, with a tribe, US Attorney's Office, or I go out and train uh, for folks that ask me to. Um, again, last year, our numbers were definitely affected because of the pandemic. But in 2019, I trained over 3,200 uh, different people at events they asked me to come to. Um, and there is no cost for that. All of my travel expenses are run through my project. We're going to talk about some of the written products that we have and also online training uh, that is available. So residential training at the NAC. This is, I put it up there just so you could see sort of an array of classes that we would do in a typical year. This was our fiscal year 20 uh, residential training uh, schedule that obviously was significantly impacted uh, by the pandemic. Uh, we shut down on March 16th and we've been on max telework since then. Um, that said, I don't think we've ever been busier. Uh, since our switch to virtual, um, the Office of Legal Education, that's where I work, and all of the different teams in that big building I showed you, our training has increased over 2,000%. Uh, so we are extraordinarily busy. But this gives you a, a, a showing of some of the classes that we would hold and fly folks in uh, during a normal year at the National Advocacy Center. Uh, here's a class photo. I always like to take class photos. Uh, this was a strangulation training. Um, so you can see a large group. This is always a very, very popular class. And why everybody has their hand up uh, for this particular class, uh, Casey Gwynn and Gail Strack, who are two of the instructors I always use, they like to have a picture with people showing their hand that says, I'm in. I'm in to help take on the tough job of investigating and prosecuting strangulation and suffocation crimes. This photo is uh, of a inner uh, tribal technical assistance working group or ITWIG as it is called for short. And many of these individuals are tribal judges, tribal prosecutors that are working to implement special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction in uh, their home tribes. And that jurisdiction would allow them to prosecute non-Indians in tribal court uh, who in certain situa situations have uh, assaulted uh, their native partner uh, in Indian country. So this is one of the classrooms, shows you just uh, again, uh, one of uh, my classes that are going on. This also is the is strangulation class. Uh, this is a different class, a prosecution class, just showing people working in small groups, um, showing the different ways that we uh, try to dial into adult learning um, through big plenary sessions, smaller breakouts, individual discussions, having people report back. Again, just to maximize the learning that takes place. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. Um, again, another small group work. Um, people were divided into teams. This is uh, one of the training rooms at the National Advocacy Center where we um, put together a crime scene and then we had different groups move through and there was evidence that they had to find um, a phone, there's a gun, uh, there were some drugs, uh, different things that they had to locate. And this is always a fun exercise because police do this all the time. It's really nice having the prosecutors do it because I think their eyes get opened a little bit to what police have to do and all of the steps that they have to go through. Um, so this is a exercise that many enjoy very much. So OLE funded training in the field. Um, this is just, uh, again, uh, you know, cafeteria style, uh, some of the training that I have taken out to the field. 
where we might have held it at, um, at an FBI office, at a BIA office, and contracted with a local hotel and flew people in uh, to, do, uh, um, to attend the training that was conducted out in the field. You know, Columbia, South Carolina is very uh, east. So sometimes we try to take something to the western part of the country so that we can um, get tribes from Alaska in the Pacific West uh, to attend. This is an example of a, a homicide training I did in Albuquerque. And we used the evidence response team for the Albuquerque FBI, and they trained folks on how to do fingerprints, make plaster casts, all kinds of hands-on uh, evidence processing work. Uh, this is a, another crime scene that we did out in the field. This training was in Duluth, Minnesota. And this picture is from a, a training that we worked on. This was the FBI and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the DEA came together to uh, work collaboratively on putting together a drug training for Indian country. And this particular training was in Tulsa. So customized training. I have gone to US attorney's offices and done day long trainings for them on topics that they feel most relevant. Uh, so this is an example of an agenda. I worked with the Northern District of Oklahoma on, went out there and did a day long training on a host of topics. There were federal prosecutors, tribal prosecutors, uh, tribal law enforcement and federal agents in attendance um, at this class. So that is something that is possible. And again, there was no cost to the district or the attendees for this training. I mentioned the criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. Uh, this is a class that we work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs on. Um, the Tribal Law and Order Act gave uh, authority to the Department of Justice to do the training uh, for officers that are seeking their special law enforcement commission. And that task has been delegated to me. Um, so that is the particular class that I was holding this week. We had about 650 in the class and they are currently taking their test. Um, so this class is one of the criteria that tribal and local officers need to get their federal authority, their special uh, law enforcement commission. Uh, not only does that allow them to exercise authority under the Major Crimes Act and the General Crimes Act, but it gives those officers holding that commission Federal Tort Claims Act coverage. Um, they may get some uh, coverage if they are injured uh, during the course of effecting a federal arrest. And if they are assaulted uh, or God forbid something worse, uh, while they are working a federal case, then the federal government, the U.S. Attorney's Office can charge assault on a federal officer, uh, et cetera. So there are a lot of benefits to having this program in place. Um, the commission is given from the BIA, but we do the testing. So we have been doing this testing for a number of years and the training in a regular pre-pandemic year, I would hold at least one class at the National Advocacy Center and US attorneys would also hold classes around the country. So you can see on this graph, let's take for example, 2018, there were 13 of these criminal jurisdiction in Indian country classes held around uh, the country and 583 officers attended. And why this is so important is this is a force multiplier uh, for uh, federal officers. You know, when we're talking about missing or murdered um, in Indian country, some of the crimes that can be at the root of the issue are very serious felony crimes that could be found in the Major Crimes Act, like sexual assault, uh, strangulation crimes, and having more officers that have the authority to be able to work those cases is very, very important. Uh, once an officer gets a special law enforcement commission, it is good for five years, and then they have to re-up. So you can see there, we track pretty consistently uh, on average between five and 600 officers that take the training. Uh, since the pandemic, we have had to go virtual. We have had four uh, sessions um, so far. 
the most recent one this week. You can see the numbers there. And we are just short of 2,500 officers that we have trained since August. A lot of those officers, that first class was for Oklahoma because of the Supreme Court decision in McGirt. And uh, this week, and all of the classes, we've been training a lot of officers uh, in Oklahoma who may now have Indian country policing responsibility that historically did not. Distance education, written products. Um, we have put out a, a equivalent of a law review journal um, every other month. Um, it, the Department of Justice Journal of Federal Law and Practice. The January issue was dedicated to missing or murdered Indigenous persons, and that issue focused on law enforcement and prevention. Uh, there is a second issue coming out uh, either this week or the very beginning of next week, also focused on MMIP. And that will look at more legal issues, prosecution, advocacy, uh, and uh, medical. So there is the link to get these. These are public facing documents. Uh, the January issue is about 185 pages and the uh, March issue is 270 pages. Uh, we have a mix of federal and native authors. Um, there's a lot of very good information in there on MMIP, and it comes at the issue from a host of different perspectives, advocacy, prosecution, uh, law enforcement personnel who have years of experience working either um, unresolved uh, homicide cases or long-term missing persons cases. So you'll definitely want to access this. There's a lot of good information. So there is just a part of the table of contents from the January issue. Uh, WebEx is the platform that we use to do the online training. Um, that's what we use for the criminal jurisdiction in Indian country course. We're also hosting a series of um, individual topic webinars on Monday, uh, March 29th. I'll be the presenter for a session on Indian or investigating and prosecuting uh, strangulation cases, non-fatal strangulation cases. We've gotten a very good response of for those sessions, averaging over 500 uh, for every session that we do. We also have a studio, um, two studios at the National Advocacy Center, and we're able to record programs. Uh, this is a program we re recorded about a year ago for NamUs. Um, and that just shows a picture of the three that are seated where the on uh, camera talent and then the crew behind the scenes that made the magic happen and uh, got everything recorded. So in addition to doing um, video projects like that one, we've also worked with a number of DOJ components on financial management for tribes receiving grants. So there's a series, a uh, five-part series that we worked on. The on-screen talent uh, was uh, OJP, uh, Office of Justice Programs, uh, the Office for Violence Against Women, and then the COPS office. So really the budget people, the numbers people um, in those offices, providing information on you know, how to uh, accurately account for the grant funds, how to write reports, how to close out programs. Those are available also for free. This is a website, Tribal Justice and Safety, again, public facing. Um, I got the little arrow there showing videos. Um, that is where you will find those uh, financial management videos. And this website, Tribal Justice and Safety, I always encourage people to bookmark it. There's a lot of good information about uh, legal developments, grant programs, technical assistance, um, and upcoming consultations. So there's what the grants financial management um, program looks like. And I don't want to eat into anybody else's time. But as you can see, we really um, have a host of things that we can provide for you. If you have a particular training need, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, we would be happy to work with you to develop something, um, if it doesn't already exist, uh, to develop something that, that meets the needs that you have or um, it can certainly point you in the direction of something uh, that already exists. So thank you for your time and I look forward to working with you in the future.
Thanks, Leslie. That's a great overview of all the wonderful training. And thank you for coordinating all that training that you provide to, to tribal law enforcement. Um, you hit so many folks. It's so important. Um, a wide variety of topics and delivery methods. So uh, congratulations on your successes with the transition to uh, virtual learning this year. Um, do we have any questions for Leslie? You can enter them into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask any questions you might have about uh, Leslie and the, the training initiative. I see, Matt, that one of our attendees just finished taking the test. Yes, apparently he was multitasking as well. Yes, <laughs> well, hopefully he passed. All right, I don't see any questions right now. Um, we, uh, again, uh, oh, here's one. How often do you hold the SLEC training? We've been holding it roughly every two to two and a half months. And uh, my goal is within the next week to get at least uh, two, maybe three more on the calendar for the balance of the year. And then we can get that information to BIA and to, uh, you know, all the folks that need to know. We publish those trainings far and wide, uh, but we'll, we'll do our best to get the rest of the calendar year scheduled so folks can plan. Great, thanks. Hey Matt, I have a quick question. Sure, go ahead, Chief Denke. Hi, Leslie, it's great to hear you and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just had an officer complete the test I was just curious, is, will the agency receive the results? I haven't chatted with him yet. I wasn't sure how it differed from the, the other programs where we get a certificate from BIA. Yes, I think uh, Chief, what we have decided to do is that we are actually going to issue the certificates um, from my office. I think that will shorten the time period because we compile all of the attendance records and the test scores, and then we have to ship them to the Indian Police Academy. We've already got all the information. Um, so what I told the students at the beginning of the class this week is that within a month, uh, they should uh, expect to receive either a certificate of completion that they can use to, um, for their application for their SLEC, or they will receive an email uh, letting them know where the problem was. Either they didn't fully attend the class or they uh, didn't pass the test. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. All right, one more chance for questions for Leslie. All right, thanks so much, Leslie. Appreciate it. Um, if you can stay on with us till the end in case there are any other questions, but I know you're multitasking there. So um, uh, that would be great if you can, but if not, certainly understand. Next up, we'll have uh, Shalimar and William from FBI uh, talk to us about the Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal and Justice Connect. Thanks, Matt. Um, I will go ahead and pause the recording now um, while we uh, queue up this presentation. One moment, please. Um, can we hold questions on your session uh, for either at the end or to reach out to you afterwards, like you said, for, uh, for additional information? I want to ensure that uh, Pamela and Wade have enough time for their presentation next. So absolutely. Yes. Perfect. You so, can either have them filter all questions to you and then, um, you know, field those out to us or they can email that email address that was listed on the screen. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So then Lisa, we can turn it over to Pamela and Wade for our last presentation of the day. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wade, I'll make you a co-host and then you can share your screen. All righty, thank you. Uh, All right, here it comes. Just a sec. Uh,
There it is. Can you see my screen? Yes. Super, thanks. Hey, good afternoon. If it's still afternoon, where if it is afternoon where you're at, I really appreciate the time. And I'll, I'll run through these things quickly. Here's an, another application um, that, um, that you can use. Uh, this one in particular is the iPod system, which is a, a, a nationwide system that, that, um, that we maintain that allows uh, authorities who come online to use the system um, the ability to send alerts to the public um, to any anybody who is part of the public who is in a particular geographic area. So, um, I'm going to these slides here. Let me get there. Here we go. Uh, just real quick, I'm going to talk about what it is and and what it does and and where everybody fits into it. Um, a little bit about. Um, some tribal authorities that have already uh, adopted use of IPAWS and are using the system to send. Um, and then um, a little bit about what, how it's being used and some examples of how it's being used and then how it is that you as a, as a tribal authority can um, basically uh, become a user of the IPAWS system. This is a, uh, we use our, uh, our kind of our overview slide and let me just talk you a little bit. Um, first, I'm going to start off right in the middle of this slide. In the middle is the is the federal system or the IPAWS system. That's the piece that we as the program office uh, have built and maintain um, primarily on the authority that the president should always have a system to warn the nation should there ever be a, a national threat. That's never happened. Uh, we've tested the system a few times, but since really um, it predates FEMA, that, that capability has been around since the um, mostly logged into or connected to radio broadcast initially, then radio and TV. Um, iPods came online uh, in, in about 2010 and began expanding uh, that access to send alerts to the public. Uh, on the right side are the systems that, that we connect to that, that the system as a, as a gateway for alerts to be sent to or distributed to. Of course, the top of that system and, and the most familiar with is the emergency alert system. So that's radio and television stations, cable, also satellite uh, distributors of, of radio and television. Um, for FCC regulations, they're required to participate in the emergency alert system. And that means that they have a piece of equipment at, at their station that is tuned into uh, other stations for distribution of alerts. State. Uh, distribution systems and other intermediaries, and also listening to this IPAWS open system that we have for alerts that would be relevant uh, for them to broadcast to their area. The newer kid on the block is the second bubble there is wireless emergency alerts. So um, I, I will bet that you've probably already gotten a wireless emergency alert, probably something from the weather service uh, or uh, an AMBER alert uh, that was sent by either state authority in some cases, there are local law enforcement authorities that have direct access to send uh, AMBER alerts. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Department of Justice's National Center for Missing Exploited Children, which assists law, law enforcement agencies, usually through a state contact, with sending alerts and managing really um, uh, the hunt and, and disseminating information for missing children that, that fit within the AMBER uh, scope of alerts. Um, we also have a connection uh, with the National Weather Service. Today, that connection basically delivers an alert that, that was written by a, an authority to an operator uh, at the local weather forecast office who then can um, choose to send that alert. And, and of course they are, they're dedicated to that, um, but they're kind of relationship based also in that they uh, want to know who the authority is that's pushing that alert through to know weather radio. If they agree, they can let that go for broadcast on know where the radio is in the area too. We have some internet services online today. And when I say services, I'm really talking about different websites or applications that have been developed to be able to retrieve alerts and then send them to their user base. Uh, one that's coming online soon, we hope is your uh, the Alexa or the dot things that, that uh, sit maybe in your house. Um, if you opt in, and I think you have to instruct the device um, that device will be able to um, uh, basically enunciate an alert for an area that's, that's pending in your area. Then we're always working for future connect, 
uh, connections on that. On the left side, we have a bunch of authorities. Uh, we kind of throw them into the bubbles of, of federal, state, territorial, tribal, and local authorities um, that basically are have been uh, uh, through an application process that that is managed in in the IPAWS office have basically registered and received uh, the, the appropriate connection um, certificates to be able to send alerts through this system. Um, there's a MOA process that we, we mentioned over there in, in the yellow bubble. Um, I'm gonna talk about that at the last slide and we'll talk about that some more. And then there is a, a digital certificate, which is a piece of um, code, uh, so to speak, that is, that is issued directly to the agency that has gone through the, uh, the MOA process. Um, that piece of software uh, gets installed uh, with a piece of software that you have uh, at, that, at, at the agency that's a user that we like to call an alerting uh, origination software package. Um, there's many, many, actually there's about 40, 40 to 50 right now, vendors that sell different pieces of software. Usually they're called mass notification uh, systems. Uh, in some cases, they're hardware systems uh, that many folks use to send text messages. Uh, in some cases, phone dialers, the things that ring to your phone and, and leave a message or speak uh, uh, emergency information or other information that's being disseminated by an agency. And in some cases, there are connections to social media sites or an agency's web page. Um, those uh, like I said, there's 40 to 50 different software pieces out there today or systems that fall into that category that are, are compliant and able to interoperate directly with the iPod system. Um, once that's enabled within, within that local system, uh, FEMA doesn't provide that software or that front end, so to speak, um, but we do work with many vendors to make sure that's working. In any case, that's where an, a person or an agency would create an alert push send, um, it will roll through the iPod system and directly out to cell carriers and radio and television stations that are supporting dissemination of those alerts based on the profile that's in the system that was created during your application process. There are uh, 1,000, as of uh, last month, as of last month, there were 1,560 agencies uh, across the United States that, that have access and are, are what we call IPAWS alerting authorities or users of the system. Uh, we've been growing that number since really 2012 is when we kind of started counting. 2012 is when that wireless emergency alerts piece came online and we've had a consistent and steady growth uh, since then. Um, we can see that there we do have today, there are seven different tribes that already have access and are users of IPAWS. And, um, and here's a map of where they're at. Today, um, uh, the, the application process from a tribal perspective is only different from all of the other types of agencies that are, or other levels of jurisdiction are out there and that the tribes uh, do, you apply directly to the FEMA IPAWS office for access. In the case of local authorities, we have the arrangement where uh, the local application, once it is started in our office, for the, us to turn them on to be able to receive alerts we have a, a coordinator in each of the states that we um, require a, a state authority to say, yes, that local authority it, it with, that lives within the jurisdiction of my state is an applicable authority to be sending alerts. That helps keep the, the locals in line with the states. That's not a process at the tribal, um, at, on the tribal application, although we do encourage uh, kind of coordination with neighboring jurisdictions, whether that be locals and states that are also uh, have the ability to send alerts within the, the same geographic area. And we do that just to, you know, to, to assist a coordinate. We do this with all the states and locals also to assist with coordination of what alerts are gonna be coming to the public um, so that there's uh, a coordination and not a potential for different information coming from different directions to the same cell phones and the same radio and television. Um, the Kokopa, Navajo, Olapai, uh, the Rincon band. Uh, I saw, I heard um, uh, Miss Lucero online from Yoseta, Eastern Band of Cherokee, and then the Confederate tribes of uh, the Chinai Reservation are already online today. And um, I know Yoseta has used the system as well as the Navajo tribe 
uh, over the past, I think, year, a year and a half. Next page. Oops, there it went. So when, it, when are these folks using iPaws? Um, and for what? Pretty much any time and for almost anything that uh, is a need to get emergency information or to get information quickly to the public within an area. Uh, 2020 was an interesting year for IPAWS. Um, we ended up being very, very busy providing assistance and kind of guidance to authorities uh, for the use. It kicked off in, in the beginning of March with a couple of um, state authorities asking about their ability to use the IPAWS system to send alerts related to the COVID emergencies. Um, uh, one thing that we are very, uh, very adamant about is that the, the authorities that are online that want to send an alert, um, they, uh, that ability is 100% within their control. It's within their authority and that they are the folks, folks that know what is an emergency that's happening in their area. And, um, and, and, and they know uh, the best way and most appropriate way to communicate with their public given their local infrastructure during an emergency. Um, so in 2020, we actually saw a lot of usage related to the COVID emergency. And then we also saw a huge uptick a uh, little bit later, starting in, in May. And then again, in um, I think uh, uh, later in the summer and in, in, well, towards the end of the year in September, related to law enforcement activities uh, due to civil unrest. Um, of course, severe weather, wildfires, and then really law enforcement usage has continued to be one of the growing areas um, and a lot of times it's messages about missing people that may not be Amber Alert qualified. Um, so silver alert usage and then other types of people. And then of course, people of interest, as well as just uh, alerts that are sent to an area to say, there are law enforcement activities happening in, in this area. Please uh, be aware of that or take shelter or stay in your house and, until uh, you get the next message. And if I got time, I have a six minute video, I think, um, that, that I'll go into some use cases before I get into the specifics. And actually, let me just talk to this slide while I already have it here. Um, use cases, and in particular, we're talking about, the said it used this uh, earlier, or excuse me, in 2020, uh, to send a message about, um, I, don't know, I forget what it was about, Pam, if you remember, but um, I think that they sent both in Spanish and English and were able to hit send and distribute a message to cell phones. And I think there was some radio or uh, stations involved in that also. Uh, Navajo Nation sent in 2020 uh, two Amber Alerts uh, that were uh, assisted in receiving or helping recover uh, some missing uh, folks related to that. And then I mentioned that it doesn't have to be that, that there's a lot of usage and the usage now uh, does not have to be Amber, although there's a specific category of phones related to Amber. Uh, messages can be sent to the other categories, the imminent threat category, for pretty much anything that is, is an emergency in the area. Um, an example on the right here is usage that uh, in the state of California for a, a silver alert. So a person that's not an amber person, but uh, they send, and of course, it shows up on the phone as it appears in the top right corner here uh, as an emergency alert. But this text below there is 100% controllable. That's written by the person who originated this message, the agency that originated this message. The interesting thing is that California, uh, the, the state have partnered with Twitter uh, so that even though there's only a 90 character window, uh, there is also a longer form of message that can go to cell phones today for cell phones that can support it. Um, they partnered with Twitter to send a link. Uh, on most cell phones, when they get that alert on their phone, they can touch that link or click through uh, to that information. California is partnering with Twitter. So California puts the information about the, the missing person or the silver alert onto their Twitter account, which is, is where that link points to. Um, and then there, at the example at the bottom is what that California Twitter page looks like when um, they're using it to disseminate a silver alert and that comes through, it gets blasted through to all cell phones, uh, takes people directly to that Twitter page. Um, California did that basically to offload the, the crush of traffic that was hitting their systems whenever they would put a link direct to the California um, law enforcement page where they had information with that. Um, that 
agreement with Twitter really has uh, expanded and allowed California to make pretty effective use of, of this to find missing people. Um, let me see if I can switch over and I'll run this video because uh, it includes, and can you, oh, I think I have to reshare, don't I? Do you see a blue screen that says uh, I pause wireless emergency alerts right now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Let me hit play on this. This is really users of the system. So authorities across the United States that we've caught in news links talking about their use of the system. And I think uh, does a much better job of, of, of conveying uh, the effectiveness of the system versus what I, what I can tell you on PowerPoint slide. Hold on, I gotta turn the audio on. Police jumping into action and rescuing a little girl. The three-year-old was at the center of an Amber Alert after the car she was sitting inside was stolen. Dave, a lot of people get these Amber Alert notifications on their phone, but nobody thinks that they're going to be the one to crack the case. When I looked outside, there was a little girl, and they were crying. It was a black Hyundai Santa Fe, like the SUV in the notification. So my first thought was I had to get her out of there and get her in the store where it was safe. It was a good move. The Butte County Sheriff's Department says Matthew Klein of Oroville kidnapped three children, including two of his own, three-year-old Ella Klein and one-year-old Aiden. At 2.30, the cell phone notification went out. By 2.34, Lolly called 911. At 2.39, Klein was in custody and the three children were safe. This really is a great example of how the Amber Alert system is supposed to work. But nine minutes turnaround time from the time people were notified to our officers having those children is fantastic. One of Metro Atlanta's biggest counties grabbed some attention by sending an emergency COVID-19 alert to cell phones. Joe Henke spoke with the head of DeKalb County about why they're taking this action. Cell phones around DeKalb County began ringing and buzzing this morning with what sounded like an Amber Alert, but it was actually DeKalb County asking people to wear a mask, social distance, stay home when possible, wash their hands often, and get tested. Well, I was just struggling to come up with a, a strategy or a resource where we could directly uh, remind and inform people to be careful, to follow the guidelines, and prevent the spread. You may have received an emergency alert from the state this afternoon telling you to stay home. The governor announced the state is now using the same system used for Amber Alerts to give the public critical COVID-19 updates. We activated earlier today a messaging system. Alerts like this showed up on the screen of nearly every smartphone in the areas where police were searching for the bombing suspect. No more a, a wanted poster, you know, on the, on the precinct house wall. Uh, this is a modern approach that really engaged the whole community. In the middle of Monday afternoon, a manhunt for a gunman near 97th and Benny. Omaha police didn't want any more victims and notified neighbors like Carol German of the danger. They sent out an emergency alert to cell phones in the area. OPD in area searching for suspect. Stay indoors. This is the first time Omaha police used the cell phone emergency alert system to warn a specific neighborhood of an armed suspect. We don't have time to go to door to door. Lieutenant Jake Ratonia made the call. The quickest way we can get that message out uh, is really through a wireless uh, type alert. Wireless emergency alerts, WEAs, are run by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Wherever there's a cell phone signal, if that tower is carrying the emergency alert, then people that are within that uh, sounding area will receive the message. 
Not long after this masked man robbed a Circle K, shot an off-duty Denver detective, and then fled, Arvada police were turning to the public, requesting a blue alert. Our system goes statewide. Now, the federal government has approved use. When a police officer is missing, seriously injured, or killed in the line of duty, and a suspect is on the run. An alert that Arvada investigators say helped lead to the quick capture of Samuel McConnell. Wednesday's alert was also longer than normal, a change that was made so more information could be shared at once. You've got to get into this to figure out how to use it. Um, and I think that's the most important thing that I would tell people is, is that if you don't use it, you will get burnt. And I mean that pun intended. Um, you have to use every tool at your disposal. And when hell comes knocking on uh, doors in your community, if you don't raise the alarm and tell people they need to get the hell out, um, you will be in a world of hurt afterwards. Uh, the more intense the emergency, the more pressure it puts on your systems. It puts so much pressure on it that the cracks actually turn into breaks. And one of the most significant ones that we had with the community was the outrage that we had not used the wireless emergency alert system as a county, as our emergency operations center. And um, it was a black eye in our community because people died. And, uh, and a lot of people who left, left uh, running away from flames. And they felt that we should have alerted them to give them more time. Well, when an earthquake hits, seconds matter. And the county tested its emergency alert system for earthquakes today. You're probably one of three and a half million people in San Diego County who got this alert today. The first test of an earthquake early warning system called Shake Alert. Here's how it works. Scientists detect the first wave of energy from an earthquake. They then estimate magnitude and location of the next region that will be affected. The alert goes out before the secondary wave hits, which brings the strongest shaking and causes the most damage. We did an experiment to see how well it worked. We set up about a dozen phones with both local and out-of-state numbers. All of them went off but one. When disaster strikes, iPause allows emergency managers and alerting authorities at all levels to send one. There it is. <laughs> so I think um, really some good, great examples of how this is be using by law enforcement uh, in there. And I, th I think that is a probably this, this community. Um, and with that, let me see what else I got here. Here's a couple of examples we, we wanted to kind of show as well. Uh, wildfire usage really took off after 2017. And as uh, Mr. Gore mentioned on the, the video uh, there, the public um, has, has kind of come around to this wireless emergency alert capability and uh, is encouraging in, in some cases. They don't always know it as the IPAWS or as wireless emergency alerts. A lot of time the public uh, refers to this as that same thing that Amber uses or that the weather service uses, um, which is the same, it is, it is that IPAWS uh, WIA access, the weather service messages that are sent to you all come through the system. The weather service is one of the first um, users really to start uh, using the system and is by far sends the most messages if you count across the nation, primarily flash floods and uh, tornadoes. Um, but um, at the bottom, this may be hard to see uh, on this little screens, but uh, you, you basically target your alert to an area. And this is applicable, ends up being applicable to both uh, wireless emergency alerts and to EAS, to radio and television, uh, by drawing a box on a screen. In many of these software products, you're drawing the, the area on the screen where you want the alert to go to. Of course, it is important if you're looking for wireless emergency alerts to work, that there are there is cellular coverage there. Um, that's a piece that that usually is is a challenge in especially many large or rural areas. But uh, once that alert is targeted, uh, you're typing the text. You have complete control over the text that is going to display on those cell phones. Uh, for EAS, there are, are parts in the software you're typing the text that you want to display on the television screen. And you can, in many software cases, uh, record uh, the message that you want to be heard over radio and television that goes out over EAS. Um, I think um, something that we are working on is to develop better uh, examples and guidance on, you know, what is an effective message. 
Uh, we're trying to bring some folks on contract that are out of the science community, the, the behavioral science, to assist with, hey, when you only have this much space, these are the words that are effective at conveying uh, urgency to a, to a person uh, that's receiving that, that to do what you're asking them to do. This is a great example that, that Pam has found from uh, Maricopa County. Uh, I believe they had been communicating about wildfires. Kind of on the left, you see that uh, this was an example of the Helena uh, Police Department in Montana. Uh, ahead of the fire, warning people that you may be asked to evacuate, you should prepare. And then here's a short text that when a uh, fire was approaching in an area, and this one happens to be in Arizona, it was a very short message that said, go, evacuations are being ordered in your area due to the wildfire. And then of course they left, uh, they didn't send it as a link, but encourage people if they have time later, right? Um, to go to, Mar oh, they did send it as a link, to go to Maricopa County, the example of the phone, of the message on the phone that you see at the right where the maricopacounty.gov is in blue means that that phone would allow that person to touch that uh, link and immediately go from their web browser through to that website. Uh, Amber alerts, just in 2020, uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, talked about or, or accredited the recovery of 26 children with the sending of a wireless emergency alert. Not um, every missing child or Amber case, uh, do they always use wireless emergency alerts or even EAS, but um, you know, they will be disseminating information through a lot of partners that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children connects with. Sometimes they, they use a WIA. Um, and, and here's an example of a WIA that actually went across multiple states um, and I, you know, the agency that it started, the state that it started off in, I believe was coordinating or using uh, the NICMIC center to assist with coordination and eventually uh, got this uh, message to be sent out in three different states. So it went out actually four, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. An example of the message that was sent um, in Oklahoma from the Oklahoma State um, Emergency State Department of Emergency Management, which supports the police with sending alerts in Oklahoma, it was on the right. Um, and again, that was uh, two children, um, a driver, a truck driver, got one of those messages, saw uh, the vehicle of interest, and was able to call 911, and uh, and they were able to um, to catch uh, and and recover the children in that case, and. And that's the, the part I mentioned earlier. We try to make this process as simple as possible, but we are a federal agency. So given what that is, um, we kind of laid out a four-step process for access. Um, these four steps don't have to be done in um, order. They can be done simultaneously. Um, the first thing that, that we do ask and that we actually require a, a certificate uh, before we turn on the access is completion of uh, the one training course that is available on the on the web, it's on the FEMA's Emergency Management Institute online website, it's IS-247. Um, we also have another course, which is IS-251. The 247 is, is really targeted as, as more of an overview, and then the 251, I believe, elevates a little bit to talk about uh, at the agency level how to manage and support long-term, develop a program for alerting uh, within your agency. Um, the, the, you do need to find a piece of software or a system that has uh, is compatible and will be able to send alerts. There's cost to those pieces of software. Uh, they range anywhere from about $1,000 up front, I think, to, uh, to possibly tens of thousands of dollars when you're talking about it, integrating it with a lot of other emergency management functions, uh, such as WebEOC, et cetera. And then many of them also have an annual subscription fee uh, which ranges uh, in cost all over the place, depending upon what additional, beyond just the iPause piece, what additional types of services and features that you use in that software. Um, we can help you with a list of software and maybe we have some resources on our web and in our iPause lab uh, where you can take a look at or, or get some um, ideas of the different softwares that are out there. Um, the first step really to uh, starting this process is to send an email to our main in, uh, box. You heard uh, Al Kenyon, who is our branch chief for customer support, is on this call as well. IPAUSE at FEMA.DHS.gov. Uh, pretty much any question that you have, and if you are 
even just thinking about it, or if you're ready to uh, look into becoming, uh, being able to use iPaws as a learning authority, send an email to that box. They'll, they'll bounce back to you with the steps in the process, the forms that are required, all the form exchange. So there, there's a signature form where to stand up a uh, access to the system. And then there's a second form, which can many times can be sent together, which is the access to send for public alerting where you identify uh, the types of messages that you wanna send and uh, the area specifically that, that, that those messages are allowed to go. And then of course, um, the systems that you wanna be able to hit. In some states, they limit their local authorities uh, from hitting both EIS and WIA, at least they initially were, some of that's changing. So that's why the systems that are on there as well as NOAA. Um, anyways, those forms will be exchanged through that email process. Uh, and then there's the same way that we would disseminate the, uh, the certificate that needs to go into your tool or your software that you're using that basically digitally signs each of those messages. And that's how we, the system uses to identify who the message is coming from and check against the permissions that are the profile that's built in the system from the app during the application process. Um, there's no people in the middle of alerts. Once you're online, uh, you type in there what you want to go and hit send and that message flows right through uh, to the cell carriers, the radio and television to NOAA uh, as it may be. So I think that's um, the last slide that, it, that I was gonna talk to today. Stop sharing and give this back to you. Um, and I think we're gonna get these slides out to you. There's our contact information, uh, myself, uh, Pam, uh, Pam Holstein-Wallace, who is online, who's in stakeholder engagement. And of course, Al Kenyon is our branch chief for iPlus customer support. Thanks, Wade, appreciate that. And thanks for everyone for sticking with us uh, as we ran a bit over here. I think we tried to, tried to pack too much in, so that's my fault over uh, the hour and a half that we had, but um, want to uh, thank everyone for the presentations. If there are, are any questions for the presenters that were able to stay, feel free to, to, to ask them now, um, and we'll give a couple of minutes to do that uh, while we wrap up. Are there any questions for Wade or uh, Pam or Al? I'm still here too, Matt. This shall Okay, work. thanks, Shalimar. I think Marsha had mentioned in the chat um, to everyone that uh, the iPaw system is really a great tool and, and resource that we encourage every tribal community to, to consider taking advantage of uh, for those uh, missing person cases, as Wade mentioned, um, if they don't rise to that AMBER criteria, this is a way for you to reach out to the community um, in those cases. The next couple of sessions we're gonna have, I mentioned earlier, so I'm not gonna go over that. Um, if you want to reach out to Operation Lady Justice, we have our website and our email there. You can reach out to us that way. Um, so any other questions for any of our presenters that are still on? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I don't see any in the chat either. So once again, I'll just say thanks to all of our presenters and thanks to our participants today uh, for joining us and look forward to seeing you for the next session uh, on volunteer engagement. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. I'll end the call now.